I wanted to start off by giving you a little bit of introduction about what problems are we trying to solve? I mean, Doug mentioned that we're doing things differently. So those that are familiar with RAID-based systems, you're going to hear things that are very different. Uh, but it's actually a beneficial in a variety of applications that we've been working on uh, in really solving that problem of eliminating the guessing game, eliminating that crystal ball of, in three years, how fast am I going to grow? And for my portfolio of applications, how fast are they in aggregate, go aggregate going to grow, but then also individually? And so that scale-up problem is really a thing of the past. It solved a lot of the problems a couple deca de decades ago, but really the scale-out architecture is one of the things that's going to help customers actually grow and buy storage only as they need. Uh, and one of the ways that we've done this is uh, we've allowed customers to start with exactly what they need, and this can be as little as a single appliance and three disk drives. Uh, from there, they can add disk drives, or they can scale out and add additional one blocks to match either the capacity, uh, the availability, the performance requirements that they need. Mute you back here. And they don't have to provision ah. anything. There's no notion of thin provisioning with exablocks. Everything is a pool of storage that is seen by the applications. And this is one of the significant differences, especially as you look at different applications like backup recovery and unstructured data, that if you take the legacy model of block or file access, they're all accessing RAID-based systems, right? blocks of storage, LBAs specifically, which is fine and it solved a certain set of problems. The challenge is that object storage is one of those things that enables companies to scale out. Now you're managing a pool of storage, but for the most part, you haven't had direct file system access to that object store. Right? And so that leads to RESTful APIs, whether it be Amazon S3, uh, Swift, you can take your pick of RESTful APIs. Um, these are obviously what Facebook and Google use for the purposes of using commodity components as little storage management overhead as possible and being able to scale and grow over time. What Exablox has done from the beginning is we've taken our intellectual property, our written our own object store, um, and had this content addressable object store be tightly coupled to a file system, in this case NFS and SMB. So now you have the same benefits of a lot of the massive petabyte scale object stores, but you can drop it in and you can point beam to it in less than five minutes and it just sees it and just sees it grow. Right? And it's a very different way to approach a problem of how do you minimize your storage cost by using commodity components, minimize that storage management overhead, and be able to deliver a solution as we began to, and we announced in 2013 when we came out of stealth mode, <coughs> solve for the SMB, those guys that as one person running the entire IT organization, right? They've got 20 hats they're trying to solve. They don't have time to manage storage. And oftentimes, they're not as technically adept as people that are doing that as their one and only full-time job. So this is where we started. Uh, we've had, uh, as Doug was mentioning, a lot of success. And when we announced the 4312 model last year, um, this is really one of the things that upped uh, our ability to address different applications, right? 10x the performance and more than 2x the capacity. But you have the same set of software capabilities for cloud-based management, tight coupling of file system access to a content addressable store that just looks like a pool of storage to Veeam or Commvault or to your digital asset management application. And so that's actually one of the things that has been attractive to not only the mid-sized organization, but also larger organizations, enterprise-style companies that are saying, I have a lot of storage. I've got tier one performance requirements. I've got capacity requirements. I've got archiving requirements. I've got data protection requirements. This is one of the things that's been pulling us up into the enterprise uh, over the past year. So what's inside uh, OneBlocks? Uh, this is one of the things that is really differentiating uh, what we're doing in that we're developing our software to provide a file system or microservices. You can think of this as microservices because NFS and SMB today, but it's not precluded to simply those two protocols. Uh, you can use imagination about what else you can have as running as a microservice that provides a file system access to a content addressable object. But we do a lot of things before those file system uh, protocols or files, files are actually converted into objects, which include deduplication and compression and continuous snapshots and things like that. But that allows us to convert objects into a distributed content addressable object store. And this is what allows us to scale out. So when you add and start from three drives and you grow to 30, you don't actually change anything from the top half, that logical portion, that file system, everything above the content addressable objects just sees more storage. But underneath the covers, we're scaling out underneath, which makes your separation of logical and physical where those objects are placed on drives <coughs> much more akin to traditional-based applications, right? as opposed to just RESTful APIs that they don't really care about that. 
So this is actually one of the things, and you'll see this slide repeated as we go through the different sections today, as we take a deeper dive into uh, our content addressable object store and how that matters for applications. So I mentioned we can do a number of things because we're converting files that users are writing NFS or SMB into objects. Um, now, we get a few things for free, and I say for free uh, a little bit lightly because we do pay a overhead in terms of we convert files, a backup stream for example, a Veeam backup stream, we have inline variable length deduplication. So as that file is being written in, we have a, a sliding segment that we look for dedupe segments. And we actually have the ability to uh, not only do the deduplication, but also we compress that before it's calculated a hash, and now we're managing that object. So the things that we can do from an application perspective are fairly advanced, right? You provide better data reduction, you provide instant recovery from files in the last few seconds that have been written to that file system, but you also have the ability to protect files over the longer period of time where you're looking at months or potentially years. You also have the ability to move that information around. Because we don't use any RAID underneath the covers, you no longer have to worry about sizing a volume or sizing the primary replication uh, cluster to a secondary replication cluster. Uh, and that allows us to do a number of things with not only just where that information is placed, but also how you handle different disk drives over time. So the 4312 is one of the things that we can actually support any mix of combination of drives from one to eight terabytes. And so if you're starting last year and four terabyte drives with a sweet spot at $150 a piece, well today you've got eight terabyte drives at 450. So now as you scale out your cluster, you can mix a one terabyte one blocks with an eight terabyte one blocks, either within the entire cluster or even within the same one blocks appliance. And that allows customers flexibility to take advantage of buying drives at retail pricing, but not losing any capacity of my RAID group isn't configured exactly the same way, right? Between one terabyte, I have to do that migration to another one terabyte. So there's a lot of things that, are, uh, that provide advantage from an application perspective, capacity utilization. And this is one of the things that we see customers typically, uh, particularly in the backup space, you know, looking at eight, 10, and the high end, we've seen 20 to one data reduction ratios for backup recovery. But the compression and the dedupe also provides benefits for the, a lot of the unstructured data. Now keep in mind that we're also not going after the high performance database workloads with this, right? It's a 10 gigabit interface. Actually improve capacity utilization is fairly significant for these types of unstructured applications. When we launched Exablocks, uh, it took a very simple pricing model. You have the price of one blocks without disks, because customers buy their own disks today. You have a one system subscription, and you have a replication, and that's it. And so over time, as you scale out, if you need 10 terabytes or if you need 700 terabytes, it's just a multiplier effect of how many one blocks appliances you need. So over time, when you don't have to guess your capacity growth in 24 or 36 month increments, you can literally buy as you need to every few months. And we have a significant portion of our business, about a third of our business is just repeat business from the same customers buying more over time. And so their costs for one blocks are exactly the same. But now when you're buying another 50 terabytes in six months from now, now you're gonna pay 20% less for those same disk drives, right? So that cost curve on the hardware, the storage hardware continues to decline. And so somewhere in the middle, you're gonna be able to anticipate that your storage spend over time is gonna to continue to decrease on a dollar per gigabyte basis. Right? And that's something that's pretty affordable and attractive to a lot of companies. They can not only mix and match, but they can buy exactly what they need, and they have a predictable cost curve. Right? But does that not cause you a problem, Sean? Because <clears throat> imagine customers buy quite a, quite a number of boxes, yep. and they've got some really older devices, which have got, say, terabyte or half a terabyte drives in. What, what's to stop them going back to the very beginning and just replacing those drives with bigger drives? Nothing. That's a benefit. So if a customer starts with Let's say they have three one blocks and but they have all six terabyte drives today and they want to upgrade them to eight terabyte, you can literally pull a six, put in an eight, repeat all the way through your 36 node, 36 disk drive cluster if you'd like. But are they paying by capacity or by unit? So they buy a one block unit, which is diskless, and they have 12 slots available. So they buy it, but they buy, if they're buying units, if, they're, if they can manage it, they can replace all the disk with new ones, <coughs> necessarily have to buy exactly. new units from you. Yep, and we have people that also buy, you know, like, they buy five or seven node, and they'll half populate all of them, so they get the availability and the spread out, and then they wait six months because they don't need the capacity. Then they buy the additional six disk drives per one blocks at 20% less. Okay. But you're happy with the fact that that model Absolutely. means they could just replace Absolutely. without so, buying new boxes? Yeah, the, you'll never do a forklift upgrade, whether it be for a disk drive if you want to. Like the 4312 support, eight terabyte disk drive. 
So anything prior to that, you can upgrade to eight terabyte. But also, in that same ring of seven is what we support today in a single cluster, next generation one blocks two years from now, when you want to retire this one, or if it's three years, you just pull that one out, and then this one just adds into the, into the capacity. And they can even, you know, depending on what disk drives they have in that old one, they can reuse those drives in the new one. Do you, do you support any generation of your product uh, in the same cluster? So, because this is works if I can, if I buy today something and in three years from now you have one, two generation. Yeah, so the, our I second have. generation hardware <laughs> forward, we're, we're supporting anything we do in the, that same cluster. The original uh, first generation, the 3308, that has a gigabit, inter a gigabit inter Ethernet interface, and so that's really designed for more of the small business as we are you know, growing up into a lot of diverse workloads. So within the 4312 and forward, yes. The 3308 is in its, in its own ring, simply because of the network connectivity, if you start to try to move that much data over one gig, it's going to be a bottleneck for the cluster. Okay, good. So uh, one system is one of the things that uh, we started with really from the ground up of there was no local management for OneBlocks. Everything is, and you can go to your browsers today, onesystem.exablocks.com. Uh, that's how you do everything. You manage, you monitor, you report on your storage all through that account. And if you're a service provider, um, you actually have the ability to manage all of your customers' OneBlocks regardless of their individual company, their individual Active Directory domains, where they're physically located in a multi-tenant architecture. And this is what we've built from the ground up. Um, and we're adding more and more reporting and monitoring capabilities. But this is something that um, as we started to have more and more enterprise customers, and they started to be, in some cases, you know, um, uh, private, uh, public entities that have closed networks where they have zero internet access, we actually have a private one system uh, that can be deployed uh, via a Docker container. So now you can run one system uh, in a private mode in a VM, in VMware, and have all the same capabilities that you do with the one system that we're hosting, but now a company that has its own network that they want to keep more tight controls on, they can run it themselves. So they have the local one system capability that's not reliant upon internet access, and they have their own organization's way to do that. So that's something that we introduced uh, late last year. And again, that's a function of some of those enterprise customers that want uh, more control uh, over that. Um, this is one of the things that helps a lot with our uh, support organization. So we see uh, every alert and alarm that happens with every one blocks in the field. Uh, we can tell you exactly how many drives, what capacity, how many units, uh, overall uh, the serial number of individual disk drives. And so our support organization can do a lot of proactive uh, management, uh, a lot of proactive notification for things that uh, customers uh, may be seeing. Uh, they may see the same thing at the same time that we do, and then we can quickly resolve that uh, via one system. So I did want to just highlight one of the things that, uh, that we focus on from a scale-out perspective, because about half of our customers today are using us as a backup target. Right? They're putting us behind Commvault or Veeam or Backup Exec um, or many others, Storage Craft, Unitrends, et cetera. Um, but as they start with whatever backup they're going to size, one of the advantages of a scale-out architecture, particularly the way that we've in implemented our... Excuse me. Yeah. <clears throat> Is there any reason why they prefer you, uh, I mean, uh, half of your customers use you as a um, backup target? Yeah, the biggest, one of the biggest advantages is the scale-out capability. So they don't have to figure out what size of a dedupe appliance they're going to need because they don't know necessarily how fast their applications are going to grow. But they also have the ability to scale the, uh, either the capacity or availability, but they have the deduplication rates of, because we have variable length dedupe, you essentially have you know, 80% the data domain data reduction ratio mm -hmm. at a tenth the price. Okay. Right? So for those that don't know, I actually didn't mention this earlier, the list price for one blocks, uh, the 4312, is just under $12,000. Um, I mentioned that eight terabyte drives today are $450 or so, depending on which one you get. Um, so for under $20,000, you're looking at 100 terabytes. Okay. And so we start thinking two, three, five, Eight, eight to one data reduction ratios for a backup problem, you're now dropping $20,000 to solve a multi hundred terabyte problem. Um, and then you start to look at the, the performance and the speeds where you're get re approaching, you know, five, 800 megabytes a second, uh, depending on how big your backup infrastructure is. That's one of the biggest advantages that people choose <coughs> us for. But they also choose us for the unstructured data. And so we have another portion that are running both the primary, you know, whether it be uh, digital asset management, file serving, et cetera, they'll run that in the same cluster as all the backup applications are. And so they actually don't have to back up the primary application data, file serving data, because of our continuous snapshots. They're immutable. 
That's the content addressable object store is immutable. So things like ransomware, people can quickly recover any of their information even if their system is infected. They, don't, they can't disable VSS. They can't encrypt and decrypt everything because it's immutable. Right? They're always going to have a copy to go back to. And then what they do is they'll replicate that off-site. And now they'll have a copy of the primary data off-site, backup data off-site. And so that's where about a, a half of a, about 25% of our customers are doing that mixed. And it's about half and half between primary only or backup only. Okay, thanks. So, um, and this is one of the things that, uh, as you define this, when you're looking at one system and we have these microservices running, Customers are really thinking about storage services, so they can turn snapshots on off, they can turn compression on off, they choose the type of dedupe, they choose whether they want to replicate it, and this is all on a per share basis. So in that single pool of storage, they can have many different personalities about what and how they want to manage that information in a given location and what they want to protect against. So very simple diagram about remote replication uh, that we've been uh, shipping since we began with the original OneBlox 3308. And a significant difference here, and you'll hear more about this when we start to talk about the, in more detail, the content addressable object store, but because we're object-based, anytime you replicate data from a primary cluster to a secondary cluster, we're only moving the deduped objects, and we're only moving compressed objects. And so it's very efficient in terms of how you scale and what you move from point A to point B. So this is what we've been doing from the beginning. What we're introducing uh, this month in, in June is the ability to do this in a bi-directional fashion. So now you have primary read-write shares with whatever storage policy you want to. It could be backup application, it could be primary data, and you're replicating that to an alternate site, in this case, San Francisco to New York. At the same time, you're going back from New York to San Francisco with VMware. But not only bi-directionally can you move that information, you can now do it in a multi-cluster environment. So now you can send the same backups or the same shares from San Francisco to New York as well as London. And if you want to incorporate another site as well, you can do that. So one to many, many to many, or many to one architecture. And now, because this is all a pool of storage in each cluster, they don't have to be sized identically. You really just have to have the capacity to support the target of whatever source share you're going to do. And again, thinking about this not on a, I'm going to do this for everything uniformly. Everything is on a per share basis that you're managing this. And you have one read-write share in a cluster, and that can be replicated to n number of read-only shares in alternate clusters. Okay? And this is, this is a simple software upgrade uh, for anybody uh, this month. They'll see that uh, just through one system. So with one system, and I'm going to do a, a demo of one system here in the next segment, but this is one of the things that allows us to very easily roll out new features to customers. So literally, when they come in in the morning, they log into one system, they'll see this ability to do this. Is there a limit to the number of nodes that can be deployed in a cluster? So today we support seven, um, and it's really from a, a QA perspective. Architecturally, there is no limit. Um, but it's a 20 byte limit okay. in terms of how many objects we can store. So it's, it's technically very large, but we're keeping things constrained uh, initially. Any other uh, questions? That good, a good overview, kind of level setting everybody with what, we're, uh, what we've been trying to do, and we'll certainly move into where we're headed. But I wanted to kind of catch everybody up for those that are less familiar with Exablox. All right. The well, re great. Replication oh. is asynchronous replication, right? Replication is only asynchronous, and it's yes. snapshot based or? So uh, it's continuous, but the recovery. So it's continuous across all the shares, but the uh, recovery point is uh, at the same point as like a snapshot. Because we're taking snapshots of everything, mm -hmm. you can disable snapshots and we just don't keep them. But if you're doing replication, we're still taking those snapshots and so you're gonna have a recovery point uh, for you know, 2.34 p.m. today, right? Or 3.33, whatever the point in time is. But it is at a, a snapshot point in time uh, recovery point when you promote that read-only share, it becomes read-write in under a minute. 